to introduce our speakers, uh, Johnny Biagini. Johnny is a sophomore, right? Junior, first year fellow, and uh, he will introduce our speakers. Uh, the order uh, of the, uh, the morning is uh, uh, Professor Kessler will speak first uh, for about 15 minutes, and then Mr. Goldberg, and then we'll uh, have a conversation among the panelists and then uh, with you, the audience. Uh, so thank you again uh, for coming, and uh, Johnny to introduce our speakers. Thank you, Professor Munoz. The topic for today's panel is the presidency of Donald J. Trump. President Trump is perhaps the most polarizing figure in our polarized time. He is detested by many on the political left, of course, but he has also divided the political right. Some of Trump's most strident critics have been never Trump conservatives. Our speakers today represent two different very conservative perspectives about President Trump. Speaking first will be Charles Kessler. Charles Kessler, or Dr. Charles Kessler, is the Daniel Dikemi Distinguished Professor of Government at Claremont McKenna College. He is the editor of the Claremont Review Books and Senior Fellow at the Claremont Institute. A specialist in American constitutionalism and American political thought, Dr. Kessler is author of I Am the Change, Barack Obama and the Future of Liberalism, as well as editor of a best-selling edition of the Federalist Papers. When it comes to Dr. When it comes to Trump, Dr. Kessler is perhaps the most thoughtful academic defender. In his May 2018 article, Thinking About Trump, Dr. Kessler argued that by latching on to his character or rhetoric, the people have overlooked Trump's virtues of humor and courage that continue to revive the Republican Party and our political system overall. Dr. Kessler writes, with his confidence in America's principles and in the ultimate justice of the people and his refusal to indulge in racial and sexual guilt mongering, Trump resembles those brave conservatives like Clarence Thomas, Shelby Steele, and Thomas Sowell, who have turned their face against the contemporary politics of liberal guilt through a focus on equal opportunity. Though FBI investigations, tweets, and shrewd public policy continue to mar Trump's presidency, Dr. Kessler believes his good qualities are the quietest part of his presidency. Our second speaker, Jonah Goldberg, takes a more critical perspective toward Trump's rhetoric, uh, character, and his lasting effect on American politics, including on conservatism. Jonah Goldberg is a senior editor at the National Review and holds the Asnes Chair in Applied Liberty at the American Enterprise Institute. A best-selling author and syndicated columnist, he is a weekly column in the Los Angeles Times, is on the board of contributors for USA Today, and is a regular contributor on Fox. He's the author of three books, including his most recent, Suicide of the West, How the Rebirth of Tribalism, Populism, Nationalism, and Identity Politics is Destroying American Democracy. In a panel discussion hosted by the Aspen Institute in Colorado earlier this year, Mr. Goldberg argued that the corrupting effect of having to defend Trump's character and his tactics is taking a woeful, baleful toll on the conservative movement and conservative ideas and is forcing a lot of Republicans to actually do this cult of personality politics rather than to actually defend their positions and make arguments. Although Mr. Goldberg said he more or less approves of Trump's foreign and domestic policy, Trump's populist and divisive rhetoric he suggested will continue to pose a threat, not only among party lines, but for the nation as a whole. Speaking on behalf of the Tocqueville Fellows, we are delighted to have you both with us and please join me in welcoming our panelists at Notre Dame, Dr. Kessler, the podium is yours. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a great uh, honor to be here and a pleasure to be here with my old uh, friend, uh, Phil Munoz, I'm my host, and I thank him and the Tocqueville program uh, for this invitation. It's good to be here with my old friend Jonah Goldberg as well, and I see a lot of friends in, the, uh, in this audience, um, and your presence here uh, gratifies me. Uh, last night, um, there was a panel discussion, a very uh, intellectual discussion, a very rich discussion with Patrick Deneen, who's here with us today uh, as well, discussing his new book. Uh, and uh, we, we brought up uh, the Federalist Papers, Tocqueville, Aristotle. It was, it was a very Notre Dame kind of uh, discussion. And to, to, this morning's discussion represents, shall we say, a change of subject. 
um, from that. Now, uh, however, to prepare you for the change, I commend to you on YouTube the Kant, Immanuel Kant, attack ad. If, if you haven't seen this, you should go immediately to YouTube and look it up. Uh, it's it's a, a, a current American style political ad attacking the positions and the character of Immanuel Kant, who's as it were posing for office. And the, the ad begins, uh, Mr. Kant would have you believe that reality is purely noumenal, be, beyond the reach of our phenomenal consciousness. And it then, it then turns to his metaphysics in one sentence, to his ethics in one sentence, and the ad concludes, Kant, Immanuel Kant, wrong on metaphysics, wrong on ethics, wrong on aesthetics, wrong for America. <laughs> Paid for by the committee to elect Friedrich Nietzsche. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then you hear this wonderful voice, I am Friedrich Nietzsche and I, and I approve this ad. <laughs> well, uh, Mr. Trump ran on the, um, what would seem to be the unassuming and almost anodyne slogan, make America great again. Uh, but the controversy that that slogan and his presidency have generated suggest we ought to look more closely at the reasons he gives for his own candidacy and also at the political situation that his presidency has uh, helped to shape uh, and helped to exploit. Um, Make America Great Again would at one, at one point I think have been a perfectly commonplace and not at all unusual slogan for an American politician. It assumes, of course, that America was once great um, and despite contemporary problems could be great once again. It assumes that there's something noble about the idea of America, about the political experiment of America, uh, something that we need to recapture. Uh, and yet this has aroused, I think, uh, it has proven to be um, a, a bellwether for the current state of American liberalism uh, and of uh, American conservatism. The kind of, uh, I, I begin by acknowledging, of course, that Donald Trump was not a movement conservative. Um, he was a Democrat for part of his life, and he has been many things politically uh, in the course of his life. But he does have an eye on the extremism of the contemporary left. The left that he sees himself, I think, as opposing is not so much the, the statist left, the left of big government uh, and the, the left that the, the libertarian side of the right is most offended by. It's not exactly either the, um, the anti-religious left or the values and autonomy left, which exercises, let's say, traditionalist American conservatives and religious uh, conservatives. The America that Trump regards, the, the left that, America, that Trump regards as the biggest threat to America today is the anti-American left. Uh, it is the left that we see emerging increasingly in the Democratic Party, a left that consists of one part socialism, very open and avowed socialism, and one part the furies of, excuse me for using this ugly word, identitarian politics, the politics of race, class, gender, transgender, uh, and the insistence which we see very pronounced on American campuses, not so much, I'm happy to say, uh, at Notre Dame, but certainly at many American campuses, this insistence on defining yourself, defining your humanity by your gender, your ethnicity, your race, uh, some sub-rational aspect, your skin color, some sub-rational aspect um, of your self. Uh, it's this anti-American left, the left that would dissolve America into uh, a congeries of competing groups uh, and factions 
um, or, and the left that would divide and conquer this, this America, disunited America, by socializing um, the economy and ruling even more authoritatively from the uh, top. Uh, it's this left that Trump, I think, has in his sights. It's this left that he particularly intends to uh, oppose. And this is the left which really began to emerge in the 1950s and especially in the 1960s, but has taken over increasingly the Democratic Party in recent years. The left that sees the problem in American politics as being not the plutocrats, but the people. Not the few, but the many. Uh, it is this left that rejects the, American, the mainstream of American history, the mainstream uh, of uh, uh, American character and American political belief as deplorable, irredeemable, uh, as outside the pale of democratic politics. Um, and it is not Trump alone who has noticed the increasing radicalism of the left. Um, the, uh, astute observers on the left have been writing books about this now for several decades. Arthur Schlesinger Jr., way back in 1991, wrote a book called The Disuniting of America. Richard Rorty, a dec uh, almost a decade later in 1998, wrote a, wrote a book with a similar warning called Achieving Our Country, and of course, most recently, Mark Lilla has written a book which got him into considerable hot water called The Once and Future Liberal, which was an attack on the identitarian, uh, the fissionist uh, mania that is seizing the American left. Uh, it is this kind of um, extreme multicultural critique of the idea of the country itself that risks turning our own children into aliens, uh, turning them into indeed hostile aliens who are either ignorant of the history of the country in its grandeur and its misery, uh, or uh, it, uh, it, what they know about the history of the country uh, is unremittingly hostile. And Trump, to his credit, in 2016, stood up to this multicultural dissolution of America and to the cultured loathing of her by academic liberals and by their mainstream followers. To do that, I think, took a certain kind of courage. To confront politically correct America, to, co to confront the politically correct furies in our politics took a lot more courage than Trump is usually given credit for. Um, because the, the, the enthusiasm for political correctness has is not just on the hard left now, it's increasingly on the mainstream left, and increasingly, increasingly is the policy of the human relations departments in the Fortune 500 largest corporations in America. It has very much a corporate capitalist component to it. These are not just, you know, uh, crazy protesters on, the, on state campuses um, around the country. This is a real, uh, top-down as well as bottom-up uh, vice that has its grip on America. Trump's loyalty to the older idea of America also bespeaks a certain justice, a kind of old-fashioned American justice that uh, in his best moments he can express uh, well. In his inaugural address, for example, he said uh, in, a, in a really a beautiful sentence, when you open your heart to patriotism, there is no room for prejudice. Uh, and I think uh, that is the kind of patriotism that he brings to our attention and urges us to return to um, at his best moments. Uh, unfortunately, not all of his moments are his best, but I think that is the standard which he would repair to um, in his moments of most uh, uh, serious self-reflection. Now, as far as the policies of his presidency so far go, um, I've noted before, and uh, I will note again, 
uh, that in, in many respects, his policies represent a return to the pre-Cold War Republican Party orthodoxy. Um, if you want to, to find the last Republican presidential candidate who endorsed protection, um, uh, who endorsed uh, restrictions on immigration, and especially the coupling of immigration with assimilation uh, once here. If you want to see uh, a president who is willing to unleash judges to strike down a democratically passed legislation that violates the Constitution, if you want to see a, uh, a, a Republican president who encourages a more modest foreign policy, uh, which is strong in defense of American interests, but uh, refuses to become engaged in long-term uh, fruitless uh, overseas wars and democratization uh, experiments, you need go back really no further than the Republican Party of Calvin Coolidge and Warren Harding and William McKinley. These were the orthodox positions of the old Republican Party before the New Deal and before the Cold War. There is nothing crazy, eccentric, uh, or even particularly novel uh, about the main lines of these policies. They represent instead a kind of uh, a return to the situation, um, the antebellum situation, you might say, before the Civil War, uh, before, the, before the Cold War, sorry. When, uh, when Bill Buckley came to endorse NATO, and to embrace the, an internationalist foreign policy, if you want to call it that, which was strongly anti-communist at the beginning of the Cold War, uh, he himself recognized that it was the peculiar situation that America found itself in at the end of World War II and at the beginning of the Cold War that justified an exception to the policies that uh, Robert Taft and others had made the mainstream Republican foreign policy in the preceding era. He thought that Taft was wrong, and so Buckley took a very strong and courageous stand in favor of NATO and in favor of a, a forward Cold War strategy. Um, but the situation has changed now. The Cold War is over, and so questions, it seems to me, have to be asked about American foreign policy, about American trade policy, about many things which made perfect sense during the Cold War but now have to be reconsidered. And when you reconsider them, one of the options as a Republican that will naturally come up is the way the party did things before the great exception, before the Cold War had intruded itself into our politics. Uh, domestically, the political situation that preceded uh, Mr. Trump's uh, election, uh, I think was a, a moment of torpor uh, both in the Republican Party and in the conservative movement. Um, the post-Reagan period from H.W. Bush to Jeb Bush, I think really those are bookends for a, a period of um, uh, stalemate in our politics and especially stalemate uh, on the right. The Reagan administration had been very successful. It had engineered a generation-long economic resurgence. It had prepared for the fall and the collapse of the Soviet Union and our victory in the Cold War. But since those achievements, conservatism has essentially been treading water. Uh, and it, both electorally and in terms of policy, it, uh, it had uh, no clear direction uh, going into the future. And the ease with which Trump was able to defeat 16 other much better qualified candidates in the 2016 primary season shows you, in a way, the hollowness of the existing conservative establishment and the party establishment at the time. And from H.W. To, uh, to George W. Bush and Jeb Bush, um, there was a, a, a silent criticism, or a, let's say an underlying tone of criticism directed towards Reagan and the Reagan Revolution. The story is probably apocryphal, but it's accurate nonetheless, uh, which, which says that uh, Nancy uh, uh, Reagan sitting beside Ron, listening to H.W. Bush's um, 
acceptance address at the Republican convention in which he called for a kinder, gentler America. Supposedly, Ronnie turned, I mean, Nancy turned to Ron and said, kinder, gentler than who? <laughs> and that criticism of Reagan for being, in a way, harsh, uh, uncaring, uh, unsympathetic, blind to the uh, needs and sufferings of the people at large gave birth to compassionate conservatism in the Bush, W. Bush term. And in a way, it also helped to, sp to spurn uh, or to spawn the, the Iraq um, adventure and the, the further uh, weakening of the Republican position in our national politics. Um, when Donald Trump came down that escalator in the Trump Tower in New York and launched his campaign, uh, that effectively sound, was the death knell of that period of Republican Party history and of American politics, the Bush interregnum, as it were. Um, he represented a way forward for the Republicans and for the conservative movement and a way to rescue the stranded populism of the Tea Party, which had been very successful in 2010 but really had gone nowhere um, after that. Now, it is, it is of course, the case, I think, that Trump is no uh, gentleman. Uh, he is certainly not a groomed politician. He is a complete amateur. Uh, and many of his missteps and his misstatements have to do with the fact that uh, he is the first president uh, who had no political or military background whatsoever. He had never done this job before or anything like it. Uh, we don't usually think of the presidency as an entry-level position. <laughs> um, but uh, it, it, the people in their wisdom thought that risking a, a rank amateur in this job was better than continuing someone with a storied career like uh, Hillary Clinton and a long family history uh, of politics. Rather than her being president, people seem to be willing to risk uh, Mr. Trump. Uh, I won't dwell on uh, Mr. Trump's uh, uh, moral uh, flaws or weaknesses because I, I'm sure that my friend Jonah will. Um, <laughs> uh, but I think that on the whole, this is a very good presidential record. It is not. Uh, the most splendid. Uh, no one would argue that uh, President Trump is the beau ideal of what a statesman should be, that he has the, all the moral and intellectual virtues that one ought to expect uh, in a politician uh, and in a, a good or a great politician. Uh, but he is better than the alternative, and I think he's much better than I thought he would be in the position of the president. He's, uh, he has learned a lot and is continuing to learn, and he is doing his best to restore American government to the control of its own people and to maintain the integrity of America and of the idea which he hopes to restore to greatness. I close uh, by saying that uh, um, uh, this argument perhaps is more persuasive than Jonah will let on, because in his recent book, Jonah himself admits that if it came down to one vote be between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, despite his loathing uh, for Donald Trump, he probably would have voted for him. So thank you for accepting my arguments. So, so first of all, let me say uh, what a great time I've had here. I've been incredibly impressed by the students. I think I should probably turn this on. Yeah, yeah it's, it's going to mess with my pacemaker. But um, uh, I've had a wonderful time. Doc, thank you, Dr. Nunez. Thank you, Charles, for coming here. Uh, I'm going to endeavor to keep this as civil as possible, in large part because uh, I consider Charles a dear friend and a person, an intellectual I've admired for a very long time. 
and because it'll be incredibly awkward if it gets uncivil because we have to share a car back to <laughs> O'Hare Airport after this. Um, uh, so where to begin? Um, it is, uh, Charles is absolutely right. If, I, if my vote came down to me, in t if the vote came down to me in 2016, if I lived in some swing county in Ohio, I probably would have voted for Donald Trump. And depending on what 2020 looks like, I would probably make that same argument. Fortunately, I have never lived anywhere where my vote wasn't canceled out at least nine to one. <laughs> so I've never much cared about the, my vote and I feel for perfectly liberated to vote symbolically on my preferences. And uh, so I did not vote for Donald Trump uh, last time and I probably will not vote for him again because I don't really care much about my vote. Um, what I do care about is telling the truth as I see it. And so what I believed at the time, I was a never Trumper. I called myself a never Trumper. Shortly after the election, I said never, I was a, no longer a never Trumper because for me, what never Trump meant was I wasn't gonna vote for the guy and I wasn't gonna lie about the guy. And so you only have one president at the time and my obligation as a journalist, as an intellectual for want of a less haughty, pretentious word, um, is to tell the truth as I see it. And one of the most dismaying things in the uh, hothouse years of 2015 and 2016 um, that I experienced was to find so many people who had ostensibly the same job description as I did, perfectly willing when push came to shove, to lie when the little red light on the cameras went on and to say something completely different when the little red light on the cameras went off. And I find that profoundly dishonorable and a small sign of the corruption that has overtaken much of the right and the conservative movement. Um, that said, I'm not a member also of the resistance, just to be clear. You know, the resistance argument is constantly, you know, I don't know, Donald Trump put salt on his french fries. Hitler put salt on his french fries, right? I mean, it's a really childish kind of argumentation that I don't cotton to. Um, for the record, Donald Trump is not Hitler. Hitler could have repealed Obamacare. Um, <laughs> Uh, part of my fundamental disagreement with Charles is that Charles takes the position um, that there is a coherent, historically grounded, reasonable, ideological explanation to Trumpism. That Trump is an avatar for a set of coherent ideas that he may not always communicate coherently, but they're there nonetheless. I reject this virtually entirely. Um, I do not think Donald Trump is remotely an intellectual. I have it on fairly good authority. He hasn't read a book in decades. Um, he does not, he is quite explicit that he doesn't consider himself um, beholden to any serious body of ideas or commitments. He says, I have to be flexible. The highest um, metric of wisdom for him is his own instincts, which he has said countless times. Um, and so I see Trumpism fundamentally as a psychological phenomenon, both in terms of understanding Donald Trump himself and vast swaths of his most intense support. It is not because there are millions of people who did not realize that they were uh, loyal to a pre-Cold War ideology of the Republican Party and finally had Donald Trump come along to represent their ideas and articulate them. It's that they liked the guy. And this is one of the reasons why I did it. I mean, I'm not, we're not gonna get into the punditry, but when Charles says, Donald Trump so easily beat 16 more qualified people for the presidency, I don't see that as a sign of his superior arguments, in part because he made so few, but I see it as a sign of the fact that we had a collective action problem in the primaries, and that when you have a 16-person race, uh, all you need to hold on to is a very significantly small plurality of voters, and you can ride all the way to the end until it's just you versus one or two other people, and that's what happened. If it had been a one or two or three if he had one or two or three competitors in the primaries, I very much doubt we would be talking about President Trump right now. So it was not because of the, his ideas had finally arrived, it was that things are going on in the culture that made Donald Trump much more compelling. And I think these are problems, this is where I'm very much on Patrick Deneen's side of the problems with our society. We are viewing politics more and more as a form of entertainment. And I will grant you this, Donald Trump is entertaining. He has turned our politics itself into a kind of reality show logic. I keep waiting for Omarosa to throw red wine in someone's face on the White House lawn. 
Um, I also disagree with Charles, and I'll get to my prepared remarks in a second. I, I also disagree with Charles um, almost entirely on his, this idea that Donald Trump stands for identitarianism. I think Donald Trump stands for a kind of identitarianism. Populism is fundamentally, historically, a form of identity politics. It uh, it's uses the language of all of the people, but in reality it only refers to a subset of the people and says those people are the legitimate people, those are the good people. Donald Trump is the first president in the American history, or at least in the modern era that I'm aware of, that talks as if his biggest fans are the only voters who really count, the only voters who are imbued with any kind of real virtue. My people are the best people, he loves to say. And anybody who opposes his people, he attacks because they also oppose him. And so it is not that he is standing for political correctness, he's doing a kind of fan service. Because when you, have, when you have this sort of tribal understanding of politics as us versus them, as a form of gladiatorial entertainment, you start justifying what he does on the grounds that it's, he's owning the libs, or their tears are delicious, right? It is, not, um, it is not a serious ideological program. And I have some personal experience with this. Donald Trump tried to get me fired from Fox News and from National Review. Um, and one of his favorite arguments was that we got into a Twitter fight where I accused him in 2015 of tweeting like a 14-year-old girl laid up, 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 up too late at night. And for days, he would go after me saying, how dare you be so disrespectful to women? This is outrageous. You have to, re you have to, re you have to resign or be fired. That is, so in that is so disrespectful of women. He was playing a politically correct card against me because it was the nearest weapon to hand. The idea that charging me of being politically incorrect will get me fired from Fox News and from National Review lacked a certain situational awareness, but that's a different issue. <laughs> also during the primaries, when Jeb Bush had some gaffe where he said something about women's health, Donald Trump for days attacked Jeb Bush as being anti-woman. So in other words, it's not, it's a, if you understand it as a psychological phenomenon, he grabs the nearest weapon to hand. And if political correctness will work for him, he will use it because he doesn't care because he is not bound by a coherent ideological or philosophical point of view. So one of the reasons why I think we're in this moment, other than the fact that we're watching politics as an entertainment, or rather, I'd say that's a symptom of the moment that we're in, is that it's an ironic moment. We, we live in one of the most partisan, arguably the most partisan time in living memory. But at the same time, our parties are weaker than they have ever been. And that creates, that is a function of lots of things that have been going on, a sort of anti-institutionalism that has been going on, a breakdown of civil society. I think right now there are only two institutions in America that a majority of Americans have faith and confidence in. Uh, it's the military and small business, and police are sort of on a bubble. Everything else is below water. Churches, schools, um, higher education, lower, uh, you know, K through 12, lawyers, doctors, clergy, everybody has lost faith and confidence. And so in that world, what happens is, as you no longer have institutions that can form character, that can, that can filter out bad actors, we start looking to brands, including personal brands, celebrities, whether it's Taylor Swift or Kanye West or, or Kim Kardashian or Donald Trump. Donald Trump comes from that world of brands. And people allotted, uh, aligned with him on those terms, not on philosophical terms. And I'll, I'll give you some evidence to that in a little bit. So one of the results of the breakdown of the, the breakdown of the power of the parties is that other institutions have served, as the, the political scientist Stephen Tellis talks about this, other institutions have taken up the slack and serve as de facto organs of the, of the parties. Conservative magazines, uh, think tanks, uh, various grassroots organizations, Fox News, talk radio, MSNBC, all of these things, they're doing jobs that were once relegated to the political parties to do, of communicating a message, of getting out the vote, of providing arguments for public debate. And that's all fine. That's what I've done for my entire adult life, be, is be part of that system. And I'm not, I think there's a lot of good things that go with that system. But the 2016 election changed the equation. Because for the first time, you had this disruptor, this outsider who came in, and a lot of people who fancied themselves as journalists or intellectuals or, or, or objective analysts were forced to choose whether or not they were going to play the role of cheerleader for a team in terms of the Republican Party, or whether they were going to still say th call it as they saw it. 
And that dynamic is what caused those people I referenced earlier to lie on television in defense of Donald Trump and then say something completely different when the cameras went off. Because when push came to shove, they saw themselves more as tribal members of a political party or a team than they saw themselves as objective observers, no matter how conservative they were. And so I can tell you stories about people who would go on camera and say, you know, Donald Trump is a passionate constitutionalist who believes in limited government and all this kind of stuff. And then the camera would go off and they would turn to me and they would say, I can't believe I have to defend this guy. <laughs> you don't. I think most journalistic ethics are kind of BS, but one of the things I believe in passionately is you're not supposed to say or write things you don't believe to be true. But this is part of the corruption that Donald Trump has had on the Republican Party on the conservative movement, is that lots of people feel the need to say things that aren't true. And over time, they come to believe the things they say are actually true, which is an even deeper form of corruption. We all know the phrase, uh, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Lord Acton, the guy who coined that, he believed that. He was a good liberal and he believed in curtailing power. But that's not the context of where the quote comes from. The quote comes from a letter that he wrote to a guy named, I think his name was Crichton, um, who was writing a history of the Reformation era popes, also known to some as the, the bad popes. And, um, and he asked, basically, Crichton was saying, shouldn't I cut them some slack given the job they have to do? Shouldn't they, you know, shouldn't we make allowances for them and all the rest? And Acton writes back, I cannot accept your canon that we are to ju judge pope and king unlike other men with a favorable presumption that they did no wrong. If there is any presumption, it, if there's any presumption, it is the other way against the holders of power, increasing as the power increases. Historic responsibility has to make up for the want of legal responsibility. Power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Great men are almost always bad men, even when they exercise influence and authority, still more when they super add the tendency or the certainty of corruption by authority. There is no worse heresy than, the, than that the office sanctifies the holder. In other words, Donald Trump does things today that if he were your neighbor or your coworker or your boss, most of you would condemn. But because he's the leader of the free world, we are supposed to judge him by a different standard. I don't agree with that either. In, in Charles's essay, Thinking About Trump, which is a great essay, he makes the perfectly valid point that America has seen immoral leaders before, and certainly that we've had leaders who've done immoral things. Can't argue with any of that. Two things need to be said about this, though. First, the form of this argumentation is a little familiar. It's the sort of approach the left often takes to defending some present-day icon or figure by pointing out how terrible America's past heroes were. Charles is nowhere near as crass or as hostile to America's historic heroes. He just seeks to defend Donald Trump by so pulling some of the founding fathers and Martin Luther King down to Donald Trump's level. Second, Charles has written more on the subject of statesmanship than I have. Charles has written more on the subject of statesmanship than I have read. But it seems to me that this is a good place to point out that hypocrisy is the vice, that uh, the hypocrisy is the tribute that vice pays to virtue. Governor Morris may have been a cat. Martin Luther King may have had affairs. None of them went around bragging about it. There's a certain responsibility that comes for men in power to at least rhetorically uphold certain notions of virtue. Donald Trump does not agree with this because it is a psychological phenomenon, not a political phenomenon. Donald Trump in his books brags about betting married women. He brags about betraying business partners. He described, we talk about how he didn't serve in the military, that's true, but he did say avoiding venereal disease in the 1970s was his personal Vietnam. He brags about his wealth as if it's the greatest single measure of a man. In his essay, Charles ignores these and countless other aspects of Trump's character, and wisely so, to instead defend Trump, defend Trump as a maker and a builder of things, and to celebrate his courage. I agree there is a kind of courage to Donald Trump because in a way, shamelessness is a superpower. If you truly have no sense of personal shame and you think negative attention is more, it, Donald Trump prefers positive attention. He clearly likes praise, but he'll take negative attention over no attention at all any day of the week. He has to be the center of the limelight, which is one of the reasons why he is constantly tweeting like an escaped monkey from a cocaine study.
I agree that there's a great tradition in American history of builders and makers, um, but I don't think the tide of that history can lift Donald Trump's boat nearly as high as, as Charles would have it. In many ways, Donald Trump is an exception to the rule in the business world. It was Max Weber who pointed out in the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism that certain behaviors tend to lead towards prosperity. Thrift, honest dealings, hard work. Donald Trump definitely works hard. He's not good with thrift. Um, uh, and he's not good with honest dealings. He comes instead, he's in many ways, there's a great cartoon explaining what winner's bias is in economics. In economics, winner's bias, it shows, it shows um, a guy saying, they told me to give up. They told me it was, a pointless, it was pointless to keep going, but I listened to my gut. I stuck with it. I said no to the naysayers, and I kept buying those lottery tickets. <laughs> and now look at me, right, because he wins. Um, Donald Trump, violated almost all the rules of good business practices, which is one of the reasons why he couldn't borrow money on normal capital markets in America. Um, it's why he used bankruptcy laws and eminent domain in countless ways to better himself. He is, I know a few billionaires. I would, he's the only, Donald Trump is the only billionaire I know who thought it was worth his time to hawk vitamin supplements and, uh, and, uh, and steaks on YouTube to run a Ponzi scheme for an educational foundation. Every other major rich person in the world, when, the, when Forbes comes out with its list of the top richest people, they say, oh no, you've got my number too high. That's crazy, I don't belong on the list. Donald Trump threatens to sue because the number is too low. <laughs> um, Patrick Deneen in his book uh, references Alexander Solzhenitsyn's famous 1978 commencement address to Harvard, and, he, and in which Solzhenitsyn says, if one is right from a legal point of view, nothing more is required. This is the problem with modernity, is that we reduce everything to whether or not, if it's not against the law, it's okay, right? It says, if one is right from a legal point of view, nothing more is required. Nobody may mention that one could still be entirely right and urge self-restraint or a renunciation of these rights, call for sacrifice and selfless risk. This would simply sound absurd. Voluntary self-restraint is almost unheard of. Everyone strives towards further expansion to the extreme, the extreme limits of legal frames. Take a look at Donald Trump's 1,500 page tax return and you get the point. Donald Trump defends all of his practices by saying he didn't violate the law. And in his books, he talks about people who bring too much moralism to business as being stuffed shirts. He, is, he brags about how he did everything he could to get as rich as possible. He said he, was, he, 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 he makes greed into a vice unto itself. The irony is, Charles wrote a wonderful piece, because he was in the audience that day at Harvard at graduation. Um, and he wrote about Solzhenitsyn's address where he said, Solzhenitsyn was arresting because, because he spoke of the truth as if it were true. Now, I have no problem, no problem whatsoever, with people, in a, in a principled fashion, with people who want to make the transactional case for Trump. The 2016 election was not a referendum on Donald Trump's philosophy. Donald Trump did not win because of his American first agenda. He won because he had, because in his infinite wisdom, he chose not to be Hillary Clinton. And an enormous number of people did not want Hillary Clinton to be president. His only two real mandates that unified the conservative movement and the Republican Party was not being Hillary Clinton, which he achieved on day one of his presidency, um, and two, promising to appoint conservative ju judges and justices. I'm all in favor of both of these things. People keep accusing me of being pro-Hillary. I challenge them, you have $1,000 if you can find a sentence I've written in 20 years in favor of Hillary Clinton. So I have no problem with that. Donald Trump, has, lots of good things have happened on his watch. There's a really interesting debate about how much of what's happened on Donald Trump's watch is because of him or in spite of him, and maybe we can get to that during the Q&A. But the problem is, is that because of the nature of our politics today, you can't just simply make the transactional argument, right? The, the nature of our political marketplace is such that you have to celebrate the man. You have to declare the man himself is the world's greatest negotiator and playing 4D chess and create a boulder so heavy even he can't lift it. We have to treat him as if he is the, this heroic figure. 
In other words, people have to lie. And that is a profound moral compromise. And you listen to a lot of my colleagues on Fox News, if you say, yeah, I really like the judges, but I think the guy has bad character, they, they'll set their heads on fire. Because you have to be all in for the team, and part of that is human nature. Donald Trump acts in a lot of ways like the head man of a tribe. People by nature do not want to believe they are following a bad person. And so what happens is the definition of good gets bent to the man rather than the man being bent to the definition. He's not striving towards an ideal of good. We are rewriting the ideal of good to fit Donald Trump. And so when he goes around disrupting democratic norms, when he goes around being crass and crude, people say, well, that's what he was elected to do, or he was elected to be a disruptor. And the very same people then will excoriate Democrats or others who violate norms in response to Donald Trump, saying how dare they do that, as if Donald Trump has a specific license to violate norms that no one else does. That's not how politics works. And so I want to be clear, this form of corruption, which is very much of what Acton talked about, is not just at the top. It's from below as well. Um, I'll give you one very good example of this. In 2011, there was a poll asking whether an elected official who commits immoral acts in their personal life can still be a good public servant. The context was basically adultery and that kind of thing. And I'm sorry, I'm, smoked, I'm drinking so much water, I smoked an enormous amount of pot before I got here and I got dry mouth. <laughs> so they asked people whether or not you can be immoral in your private life and still be a good public servant, right? Uh, and fitting the stereotype only 30% of white evangelical Christians, self-identified evangelical Christians, said that this was true, right? They were the most judgmental demographic on the list. Fast forward to 2016, they asked the same question. And the number of white evangelical Christians who said you can be immoral in your private life and still be a good public servant more than doubled, doubled to 72%. Now, this means, if these trends hold true today, and I have to assume that they do, I don't think they've updated the poll since then, that means that white evangelical Christians are today the single most tolerant demographic in America of sexual impropriety and infidelity in public servants. That's corruption. And so, my view of all of this is by all means, we can have an argument about the public policy, we can have an argument about the appointments, but for me, public conservatism, when you strip it of prudential questions and metaphysical allegiances and all the rest boils down to just two things. The importance of ideas and the importance of character. The importance of ideas means this idea rooted in the, in the American founding and the, in the English Enlightenment that through logic and reason and appeals to conscience with facts and evidence employed by logic and reason, one can persuade people that certain things are better than other things, that certain approaches are preferable to others. And the other is this idea of character, which just simply says that your internal character matters. How you live in the world matters in, as a term, as a kind of virtue. There is no definition of good character, I would argue, that Donald Trump can clear. Even if I'm willing to stipulate that, that Donald Trump has more courage than I believe and as much courage as Charles believes. There is simply no definition of good character. Forget the fact that he has more ex-wives than the previous 44 presidents combined. That doesn't matter, right? In business, in personal life, in the way he conducts himself in public, you cannot say the man is of good character, and I won't. And I'm not, saying, I'm not saying that Charles is corrupt, and I'm not saying he's lying, but my problem with his arguments is that he is, he is giving breathing room and space to people who are dumber and more corrupt <laughs> than Charles is to make precisely those kinds of arguments. And I see it every day in the trenches in Washington where I see young pundits People like, I don't know, Charlie Kirk and these people who simply think that the definition of conservatism is a personality cult of Donald Trump. That's not what conservatism is supposed to be. We are not, Bill Rusher at National Review used to say, politicians will always disappoint you. Put not your faith in princes. And that spirit has overtaken so much of the right and it breaks my heart. And so as Alexandra Solzhenitsyn said, you can resolve to live your life with integrity, but let your credo be this. 
Let the lie come into the world, let it even triumph, but not through me. And that is my approach to all this. It's cost me friends, it's cost me money, it's cost me not a good night's sleep. But for me, I'm perfectly happy to celebrate the good things that come as a result of Donald Trump being president or Hillary Clinton not being president, but I'm not gonna say the guy is something that he is not. And what he is not is a good man. Thank you very much. Maybe I can uh, ask a few questions of each of our speakers. And Charles, maybe just to have you respond to uh, what what Donald Trump, according to Jonah, is really attacking uh, the moral foundations of conservatism, corrupting conservatives' judgments. Uh, How how do you respond? What do you think? Well, I think if, uh, if the phenomenon that, that Jonah is pointing to were um, widespread in the conservative movement, it would be a quite legitimate concern. But, but the people I know uh, who defend Trump, and I'm, I, I don't live inside the Beltway, so maybe the people I know are not the same kind of people Jonah is associating with. At, uh, at Fox News and elsewhere. But I, must, I don't know anyone, really, who defends Trump by saying either that he is a good man or a good moral ex- exemplar um, and therefore is a good president, uh, nor do they say that his character doesn't matter, only his actions or the effects of his presidency matter. Most people I know who defend Trump include in their statement a paragraph in which they regret Trump's acerbities, his weaknesses, his multiple wives, the very messy life he has led uh, morally and otherwise, but find that, uh, and do not ignore it or explain it away, they confess it, but they admit that his policies as president and to some extent his um, uh, goals and principles as president uh, conduce to the public good. And therefore you have to take the bad with the good. But very few people do I know who actually don't believe there is a bad side to Mr. Trump or, uh, or much less um, reinterpret badness as goodness, as, a, as positive things. I don't know anyone who makes the argument that you know, three, three wives is better than two, uh, and then two better than one, or... You the know. crown prince of Saudi Arabia does. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet an American voter. That's a, Fair yeah. enough. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, I t- just a very quick response to that. Um, I agree, there some of the best intellectuals Um, who defend Donald Trump um, use precisely that rhetorical approach where you get these to be sure sentences or paragraphs that concede in fairly anodized terms vast swaths of the argument of critics of Donald Trump's and then go on to attack critics of Donald Trump's for giving voice to them. And this is a form of argumentation that's usually called anti-anti-Trumpism, which says Uh, which concedes the bulk of the argument of of Trump critics, at least from the right, and then goes on to say, what's wrong with you Trump critics for criticizing these things? And that is the way it is uh, received in large part by the mass of of, of sort of news consumers or opinion consumers out there. I will be glad to provide a longer list of people who do, in fact, uh, say precisely things. When I said recently on... uh, Twitter that there's no definition of good character that Donald Trump can clear, uh, it was like someone had hooked up a fire hose to a sewage tank aimed at me afterwards, where lots of people, including people like David Horowitz, argued that Donald Trump was in fact a man of sterling character, loyal to a fault, and all of the rest. Um, If you watch Fox News, you have people like Jesse Waters, my colleague, um, who you know openly talks about you know there are a lot of people who wish we had you know Trump could be dictator just to get things done. 
Um, there's a lot of incredibly dangerous and poisonous rhetoric that is out there um, designed to defend Donald Trump and what he holds and what he, what he does. And, um, and I find that, that it, is, it, it, is, it is good that Trump's more honest and intellectual defenders acknowledge Donald Trump's shortcomings, but I don't think that that ends the issue if they then go on to say that anybody else who makes a bigger deal out of them than I do is irrational and, uh, and is, is getting in the way of the important politics to be done. I think the point of being a, a writer is to make the case for why things matter, even if they get in the way of the legislative agenda of the Republican Congress. Let me just follow up briefly. I mean, <clears throat> what I, I'm uh, a little surprised that the that this line of criticism of Trump has has not m moved. It's not budged. I mean, the very same criticisms of his moral failings that one could that Jonah has given us a a, a short and pithy um, statement of <clears throat> consume many 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 column inches. Um, every day in the U.S. press, and, but it's essentially the same series of indictments that you could have heard in 2016 and 2015. Um, the, not that they have, you know, the, the, the causes that are being discussed have gone away, but things have happened since then. And one wonders how many, how much good policy, um, at what point does good policy suggest that the picture of his character that has been drawn is not false, but is incomplete. I mean, it doesn't acknowledge other aspects of his character, like his courage, uh, his sticking by Kavanaugh, his picking Kavanaugh uh, in the first place, or whatever issue you might want to uh, yeah, I, rest on, which, which suggests that we need to fill out this portrait of Trump's character beyond the adultery and the the, the, the standard charges, which I'm not, I mean, as I say, they're not false. They, they, are, they concern very true facts and, and, you know, aspects of his character, but I'm not sure that they're capturing, they're doing justice to the, to the whole of his character that we have yeah, I, I, evidence of. Now. I have two quick responses to that. One is, you're right, a lot of people harp on this stuff. Um, I don't every day still harp on these things, but this issue was about the man and his presidency, and so I revisited some of them. But the, uh, the fact is, is that his character manifests itself daily, hourly, or weekly as president, and so his character continues to be of relevance because his character occupies the executive branch. Um, and uh, you bring up Kavanaugh, which is an argument I hear a lot in the last week as being a sign of his good character. I think this entire discussion about Donald Trump's Supreme Court picks, and Kavanaugh in particular, puts the, whole, puts the facts on their head. Donald Trump, the reason why Donald Trump had to come up with that list of judges is because no, not, forget the MAGA crowd. They were willing to put him on when he was talking about, they were willing to elect him when he was talking about putting his sister on the Supreme Court. The bulk of conservatives were still very, nervous. Even if they liked Trump, they were still very nervous about Donald Trump and his judicial appointments. They said, we can't lose the court. And Donald Trump, thank God, wisely heeded counsel to come up with a list and promise to nominate people from that list. In other words, the list was imposed on him, not by his biggest fans, but by his most relevant critics and skeptics. And thank God he stuck to the list, and that's good. I don't think he stuck to the list as, a, as, a, as an expression of his character. It's an expression of the fact that he has been, it has been communicated to him that there is a red line that even he cannot cross on the transactional terms. And um, it's great that he stuck by Brett Kavanaugh, but Brett Kavanaugh would have been on a short list for any other Republican president. And this is one of my problems with a lot of Trump critics who are harsher than I am, who don't want to take credit for the things that we're actually forcing Donald Trump to do, like be pro-life, which he never was until a few minutes ago, um, and to appoint conservative justice, which he never cared about until a few minutes ago. Um, and meanwhile, Trump's greatest supporters want to take his use of a list that was imposed upon him from outside as proof of his actual convictions. 
if people believed those were his actual convictions, the list wouldn't have been necessary. Jonah, let me, let me um, uh, press you a little bit on, uh, not on the character issue, but more on just the politics and policy. Sure. Uh, lots of social conservatives, uh, and you've seen this since the Kavanaugh uh, hearings and, and confirmation, have said, look, um, whatever I think of Trump the man, uh, he's what's standing between me and my traditional values and my family values and a Democratic Party that uh, not only doesn't represent my interests, but is after me. Mm -hmm doesn't want to tolerate me, doesn't want me to be able to run my business the way I think, wants to re-educate me and re-educate my children. Mm -hmm. I'm glad Donald Trump is on my side. Mm -hmm. uh, what's your response to them? Yeah, if, again, I, I think I addressed this a little bit in the beginning. If the argument is that Donald Trump is an extremely useful Medusa's head to pull out of a sack and petrify your enemies, you got me. You're right. <laughs> um, and. At the same time, though, I do think that, uh, you know, I didn't mention it in my prepared remarks, but one of the forms of corruption that we get from Donald Trump is what it's doing to the left, which is becoming, and this is hard for someone like me to imagine, worse than it was. They're convincing, they are now in the process of convincing themselves that they need a Donald Trump. They need, you know, they're, they're, they're looking to get that, you know, Axe body spray covered ass clown Michael Avenatti to be president of the United States, right? There's, there's, a piece on, there's a piece on Vox today making the case for abolishing the Supreme Court. Others are talking about court packing, right? Um, when Donald Trump won, liberals who had bragged about the, having their, this huge advantage in the Electoral College for decades and saying how this showed that America was on their side, the second it worked against them, instantaneously it became a bastion of white supremacy and slavery. And this gets to the heart of something where Charles and I agree with entirely, is that the nature of progressivism, certainly since Woodrow Wilson, is to go wherever the field is open and discredit any inconvenient obstacle to their, their will to power. I agree with that entirely. But the question is, yeah, it, Donald Trump is entertaining and he's winning some victories in these battles when you have both, both houses of Congress in your pocket, he's winning some of these victories. But is he winning the long war against this kind of politics, or is he making this kind of politics worse? And I would argue he's making this kind of politics worse. So much of our politics today is driven by negative polarization. Most people are Democrats because they hate Republicans, and most people are Republicans because they hate Democrats. And Donald Trump is fueling that rather than trying to govern as a president of the entire country. And I think that is going to set I like to ask people, what is it that the next Democratic president can do that you won't be a hypocrite for criticizing, right? When, when Barack Obama was office, lots of us criticized uh, crony capitalism and picking winners and losers. Now Donald Trump is doing it, and a lot of those people are saying it's awesome because the winners are our coalition and not their coalition. Well, that's going to be a real problem when Elizabeth Warren comes in and you know, first first thing she does is take over the radio stations. But who knows what else comes after that? Um, and so some of this, I would just argue, is the short-term victories are fun, and some of them are necessary. And the stuff on the court, I would argue, is great. But the long-term argument about rhetoric and statesmanship, about setting the course of the nation on a path that will leave it better off down the road, I'm not sure Donald Trump is doing that because he's really bringing out the worst in his enemies too. Charles, can I have you speak to that? Uh, so you write uh, and, sp and speak about statesmanship, about political rhetoric. Uh, your, your book on uh, Obama analyzed his rhetoric very carefully. Um, what's Trump doing to our political rhetoric? And what does that mean for the future? And not only for conservatism, but as Jonah just pointed out to the, the visceral and negative, and some people would say unhinged reaction on the left. So the, the long-term effects of Trump, what, I, this can't be good for the country. Well, <clears throat> look, I, I don't think the left needs Trump uh, to uh, uh, screw themselves up to a, a new higher level of anger and indignation. They do that on the campuses. They have been doing that on the campuses long before Donald Trump uh, appeared on the political horizon. Um, what we have today is a kind of, I mean, the, 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 the psychosis of the left, or the, you know, the, the, the problem of the left is that it, 
its heart and soul really is in the campuses now. And for at least a generation, really longer than that, liberals have basically run American universities. They dominate the professorships, they dominate the administrative, burgeoning administrative class in the colleges, and they have gotten used to running the universities in a very authoritarian way uh, in which uh, f you know, free speech is something doled out to people whose arguments you agree with but denied to those uh, with whom you disagree. And the problem is the left now has, has so enjoyed its tyranny over the universities, it would like to run the whole country the way it runs the universities. Uh, and to impose a, a regime on speech, uh, I, I mean, the Democratic Party in the last election was officially in favor of amending the First Amendment to narrow its protections of political speech. It's in favor of amending the Second Amendment to narrow the protection of gun rights. Uh, these are not positions that Trump forced it into. These are positions that the party has been, the Democrats have been moving toward for a long time, driven by the uh, ideological harpies in the university. Uh, I don't think we can blame Trump for that. I think one ought to celebrate his resistance to that. Uh, and I don't, I don't know that Jeb Bush or any other plausible Republican contender would have had the stomach to stand up to the kind of criticism uh, and hatred that has been directed towards Trump. As far as his rhetoric goes, to come to your question more directly, um, there is a problem in the Trump rhetoric, in the, in the Trump administration. Um, there's what I call a persuasion gap. Um, I say that Trump, in his, in, in his blunt way, raises very fundamental questions about what is the future of NATO? Are we going to be in NATO forever? What is the purpose of NATO now that the Soviet Union has ceased to exist? When he raises questions about, you know, how long are we going to stay in Afghanistan? We've been there 17 years. What's the purpose of staying in Afghanistan? The military establishment rebels against being asked these fundamental questions. But it's a president's job, it seems to me, to question the reigning orthodoxy in the executive branch and in the legislative branch. Uh, the problem I'm identifying, however, is that Trump is asking the right questions, but, but those questions do not then result in, you might say, the kind of serious political speeches that would develop those questions into a position and into a coherent policy. And so the State Department and the Defense Department basically, to the extent they can, s manufacture their own policies and their own speeches to explain them. And the President's control over his own branch is very imperfect, uh, I would say. And he is aware of this, um, I think, to a growing extent, and is impatient with it, and has, has you know, played musical chairs to try to find people who will pursue his own policies. But even in pursuing them, there's still a, you, you must try to speak to the people and persuade the people. Uh, and th if the agencies don't do it, the president has to do it. The president has to carry that ball, and he, does, and he hasn't, I think, adequately so far. But having said that, uh, Trump speaks as a citizen to other citizens. Um, there's nothing condescending about his rhetoric. There's nothing expert uh, about his rhetoric. There is none, none of the uh, professional politicians' condescension to the electorate. And I think that's one thing that the American, that allowed him to connect with the American people and that the American people continue to um, admire and to enjoy. He is funny. He is entertaining to everyone except reporters who seem to have no sense of humor whatsoever, especially about themselves. Uh, but to ordinary Americans, I mean, when he does these rallies, and he does too many of them, I would say, just as he tweets, you know, uh, imprudently, uh, many times, not all the time. But when he speaks to them, I mean, he speaks for an hour or longer, and he's able to keep the audience laughing and engaged and cheering, and that is a very difficult thing to do. Um, it, is not, uh, you know, it is not a requirement of statesmanship to be able to do that. Um, it is useful 
to be able to do that if you are able to turn that you know, towards larger, a larger uh, public good. Uh, and I don't think that the, the worst moments of his rhetoric the, or the things that he has said that are the most offensive to ordinary Americans um, have been said uh, off the cuff and, uh, and, in, and without forethought and he is not good at correcting his own positions and restating better uh, what, he's, what he said in the first place. And the Charlottesville example, you know, with the protesters clashing over the removal of a Confederate war statue, it was the worst case, uh, the lowest point, I would say, of his, um, of his presidential rhetoric. We uh, have a little bit of time for questions from the audience. Um, uh, two things. One, we have a tradition here where we always invite uh, an undergraduate student uh, to ask the first question. Uh, and secondly, uh, please actually ask a question. And we'll uh, try to keep it brief so we can get as many in as possible. Toby has a microphone. Uh, if you stand up, uh, undergraduate, Notre Dame undergraduate. Let's see, Keenan in the back. Uh, Keenan, tell us who you are. You only get one. You only get one. <laughs> Hi, I'm Keenan White. I'm a senior um, studying political science. Um, if you look back to the founding generation, obviously it was um, very rare to see if it happened at all. I don't even know if it, if it did to see somebody uh, as a career politician. Um, and that was kind of some of the, one of the main elements of the virtue of that founding generation is that they would have a, a primary career, step away from it to serve the common good, and then go back um, to their primary career. Um, obviously, in the 2016 election, we saw it was kind of trendy to be a political outsider, and Donald Trump is a great example of that. In that sense, is he setting a positive precedent or a negative precedent? Um, yes, yeah, so in 2015 and 2016, I would tell my liberal and democratic friends that the, however Trump turns out, the precedent he's setting is a much bigger problem for you guys than it is for my side because he's breaking the blood-brain barrier between politics and entertainment in a way that we've never done before. You can, people are like, well, what about Ronald Reagan? Ronald Reagan, first of all, he did his homework. He was a, he was a governor of California. He took ideas seriously. He's the head of the Screen Actors Union. It's a different model, but you can make the case that he moved the, the goalpost a little bit. But Trump was something very different. Is one of his key uh, qualifications was that he was a celebrity and that he didn't know anything about the swamp or whatever. Now, if you look closely, the Republican bench of celebrities kind of peters out at Scott Baio. Uh, the Democrats have everyone from you know, Tom Hanks and Oprah, uh, George Clooney, you go down a very long list of people who can simply with their face in their name by billions of dollars of, of attention. And this is one of the reasons why, I, again, I think the pro, Donald Trump didn't create most of the problems that we have. I don't make that case. This is a big argument in my book. He's a symptom of problems that go much further back. And uh, there's this line in Orwell where Orwell says, a man can feel himself a failure and take to drink and become all the more of a failure because he drinks. I think Donald Trump is making a lot of the problems we have worse not better, but by no means is he to blame for all of it. And my concern is, is that I do think that this is a precedent and that you're going to see the reality showification of politics continue apace. There may be a reaction to it. I mean, Jimmy Carter got elected because he said, I'll never lie to you. It was a reaction to Nixon. There could be plausibly that kind of counter reaction to Trump, but it doesn't look like that's what's shaping up right now. It looks like what the Democrats are doing and what the media wants them to do is, I mean, when you have Eric Holder saying, when they go low, we kick them. <laughs> and when you have Hillary Clinton saying, you cannot be civil to people who disagree with you, blah, 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 blah. This is a sign that the supposed intellectual leaders and political leaders of democratic and liberal institutions are now going exactly the other way and giving in to the same sort of mob mentality that they claim to decry in the other side. And I think it's going to be a vicious cycle for a while to come. Another undergraduate? Could I say something to that? Please, please. Uh, I think it's, uh, my own reading of the Republicans is it's likely that you, 
that you will get a professional politician to succeed him as the Republican standard bearer. I think uh, Trump has pushed the edge of the envelope so much that there will be a natural spring backwards towards a, a someone with a little more preparation uh, and a, a, you know, a, a deeper background uh, in politics. Uh, as with the Founding Fathers, I mean, they were mostly professional politicians, but the term of the legislature was only a few months. It didn't last uh, all year. And they were itinerant professor, pr professionals. They would move from one elected position to another. They didn't stay in the same job for 20 years or 30 years. And so they were citizen politicians in a different sense maybe than we think of it today as someone who spends their life outside of politics and then comes in. Um, the founders maybe had a better uh, a sort of middle road there where you, they go into politics fairly early, but they are not on the job all the time and it's not the same job all the time. They're also farming, they're lawyering, they're doing something else uh, many months of the year too. Another undergraduate question. Uh, go ahead, Johnny. Um, yeah, thanks again for coming, Mr. Goldberg. Uh, I just had a question. So I know that you uh, clearly think that Trump uses rhetoric more as a weapon, um, and it's very devices for the country. But I know on Ben Shapiro's Sunday show that when he asked you to grade his foreign and domestic policy, I believe you gave him a B or B plus, something around that. I can't confirm or deny that. I just don't <laughs> right. remember. Um, <laughs> but it, it was positive. I know a lot of people make the argument that Obama, though he was not you know, weaponizing his rhetoric, he was weaponizing his policy. Um, whether that be with his taxes uh, against conservatives, maybe you were one of them who was targeted, or uh, even in his Iran deal, um, or even in Obamacare. Mm -hmm. uh, so my question is, do you believe that rhetoric is more divisive, um, or is policy more divisive when used as a weapon against American politics? Uh, it's an interesting question. I'm just not sure I have to choose, right? Because uh, it, it, it depends on the context. Sometimes the rhetoric is worse. You know, when Woodrow Wilson says that hyphenated Americans are holding a dagger to the heart of our country and must be rooted out, uh, that's rhetoric. It's pretty poisonous. Uh, the Espionage Act is pretty poisonous policy. You can, both things can be poisonous at different times. Um, I, I, I think my record is better than most on my, I mean, I didn't write a book about Obama, but I pretty, came pretty close uh, to being a fairly consistent critic of Barack Obama. Um, and I think that Barack Obama is respon not con well, both consciously and unconsciously responsible for the rise of Trump. They, as a matter of policy, elevated Trump as a critic and they admitted this. It's in these oral histories about the Obama administration. They, they promoted Trump's birtherism as a way to make Republicans look bad. Um, ben Rhodes writes about this. Um, I think it's Ben Rhodes. Um, and, you know, that's... You know, look at you now. I mean, it, it blew up in their faces, right? Uh, but also, I think his policies, his approach to politics, um, fueled not just the rise of the Tea Parties, but this attitude on the right that I deserve some blame for. I mean, I'll take my share of blame. Um, my first book elevated Saul Alinsky as, a, as an important person to understand aspects of the left. I wasn't praising Saul Alinsky. I said Saul Alinsky was a bad dude. He dedicated his book to the devil. Um, but uh, over the last 10 years, we've seen this rise of what I call Alinsky envy on the right. And Alinsky would argue that the ends justify the means, that any tactics necessary to victory are worthwhile. The right convinced itself that the left used these techniques to control everything, even as the Republican Party was winning election after election across Barack Obama's entire presidency. Every election proved to them that the left was still winning somehow. It was a very dysfunctional understanding. And my problem with ends justify the means arguments, including Michael Anton's Flight 93 election essay, is that when you start making the argument that ends justify the means, the means become ends in of themselves. And you can see this on college campuses all over the place among young conservatives who make these arguments 
that just pissing off the left is its own reward. Not persuading the left, not persuading the neutral observer or the middle of the road observer, but just, you know, their tears are delicious. And you get these arguments about Donald Trump too, that when he does something absolutely indefensible, the only defense people fall back on is, look at the people he's making angry. <laughs> That's not a great argument to me. And um, while I understand Charles's point about pushing back on a lot of those forces, the question is, is a pragmatic one. Is he converting more people to our side, such as it is, than repelling them to the other side? Right now, college-educated Rep Republican married women are like the dodo in the polling data. They just don't exist. Donald Trump has repulsed women, college-educated, mostly white women, in staggering numbers. And this idea that, and, but yes, we are getting more, Republican Party's getting more blue-collar whites, non-college-educated whites on board, but far fewer than it's losing. And it's like that old thing about how, yeah, we lose money on every sale, but we're gonna make it up in volume. Um, there is a prudential question about whether these tactics work in the long run, but I'm by no means willing to defend Dar Barack. Barack Obama was a very sophisticated troll. The way he knew how to push buttons on the right and make people a little crazy, and he thought it helped him because he thought it was a way to sort of polarize the, 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 the electorate and get more people to think Trump was, uh, Obama was the reasonable one. And so he, historically, whether he intended to or not, has a lot to answer for, both as, as policy and as rhetoric. But that's a, his, it's an interesting historical question. I don't know that it means I should take, it, it, it flows to any specific conclusions about Trump and his presidency and his conduct. I, I would say on the question of uh, grading Trump, I was asked by, the, by New York Magazine at the end of his first year, along with, I don't know, 49 other so political scientists or something, to give him a grade on his first year in office. Um, and I gave him a B minus, which- uh, Which is I know, a good grade from you, though. I know, it sounds, <laughs> it sounds like uh, a very low grade, but, it, but it's the highest, it's the lowest honors grade, you know. So it's, it, had, <laughs> it had a certain honor to it. Uh, and it, uh, it was above average, so clearly um, above average. But in, uh, now, as we approach the end of the second year, I would give, I would give a higher grade, I think. Uh, probably a, a, I don't know, a, a B or B plus, I would say. But Jonah is correct in saying the long-term effects of the, of the rhetoric cannot be ignored. Um, and it's not just what he says and, uh, or how he says it, but what people think of what he says and how he says it, and you, you know, that is a, a crucial metric. But it, it, uh, it's, um, that's still very much an open question, and we'll have more data in a few weeks after the 2018 election. Okay, let's get a couple more questions in. A gentleman in the, in the back here, if you can wait for the microphone, tell us who you are. Hi, I'm Dave Thompson, I'm a double domer, uh, 55 years ago. Why I am really encouraged by what I see. I realize that Mr. Trump is not a choir boy. But I sympathize, Jonah, with you that if you identify yourself as a Democrat, that there's two Democratic parties the way I see it. The Saul Alinsky Democratic Party, the progressive side, that are these radical, your talk about listening to people and negotiate, I mean, debating arguments and hearing, hearing how the, and maybe, maybe even open your, your mind and change your mind. That doesn't exist in Alinsky's world. These people talk over you, they don't let you. And as a double domer, <laughs> my faith votes. And the fact that the Democratic Party does not show God any place, and that's meaningful to me. My grandchildren, and my, my children and my grandchildren, I worry about the world that they're gonna grow up in if this and justifies the means, it's the acceptable way. Power politics, just make it happen. Doesn't matter how you do it, who you lie, and you know about lying. Politicians lie. Gee, I don't know if anybody would disagree with that. Occasionally, politicians will tell you something that they are gonna do when they get elected, and then don't do it. That sounds like a lie to me. If you look at Mr. Trump, what you see is what you get. Another, uh, another question. Uh, right here in the front, please. 
Thank you. Um, as we know, oh, so there's. Are. Sorry, my name is Kevin Zufelt. Uh, I am not a student yet. Uh, but as we know, every story has two sides. Uh, and the one thing I have definitely seen as a positive coming out of this presidency is the exposure that the consistent of Fox News isn't real news that we've heard for decades is also the case for MSNBC. So is there a path for it, some actionable items to show a way around both sides being that polarized, both sides not telling the full truth to actually get an educated electorate? How do we improve our civic knowledge and civil discourse? Well, <clears throat> that's a good question. And actually, there's a little cause for optimism. Uh, reasonable liberals, uh, in reaction to the Alinskyite type um, liberals, uh, are beginning to, uh, to admit that we have a problem and that our young people don't know enough about American history and American government. And what they do know is often so one-sidedly hostile as to be worse than ignorance. Um, and like Yasha Malk, a young political scientist at Harvard who's written on, uh, wrote a recent book on democracy, um, there are some reasonable people who are saying we need, we need to get over the uh, obsession with uh, victims in history and looking at history from, purely from a victim's point of view, and we need to celebrate the achievements of America as a country and as a civilization too. And if there are enough, if that move, if that awareness spreads, as I hope it will, there probably will be enough reasonable liberals and and reasonable conservatives out there to put civic education back on the front burner. It should be one of Trump's great concerns. Um, and he should be very interested not simply in K through 12 education from the point of view of sort of funding and charter schools and so forth, but also what is being taught about America in the schools that are being paid for by Americans' tax dollars. It's a great issue for him. Uh, it's one that he hasn't discovered yet, but I think it would be very fruitful if he did discover it. Okay. There's a question way in the back. I will say the Department of Education has just announced this um, program to fund graduate education and the study of the Constitution and things that we're doing here at, at Notre Dame. Uh, it's very small though, yeah. Okay, uh, tell us who you are, yeah. Hi, I'm Nora. I have a uh, bachelor's and master's in English from Notre Dame. That department will probably be horrified that I'm here. Um, <laughs> I think, so my question I think is similar to the, the previous um, young man who asked a question. Um, but my question is, when I dialogue with um, friends and family who don't like President Trump, it's becoming increasingly that they can't argue against his accomplishments. They're arguing um, against his rhetoric and tone. So I guess my question is just, um, in light of studies that I'm seeing, like I'm looking at a study right now, um, that 92% of coverage on Trump is negative, but the American populace seems to be happy with a lot of his accomplishments. Does he have a choice? Like, can his, have they given him a choice to have positive statesman-like rhetoric? Um, I'm not sure, I didn't know who to vote for. Um, and it was, in, it was when he started to point out the biases in the media and like the tactics that they were taking that I started to awaken to his side. So I guess my question is, does he have a choice? Or does he have to, like, is there, are they, have they given him a, him a choice to have a statesman rhetoric? Okay, yeah. the, the media environment and how does Trump sure. function? I, I mean, there are, there are a bunch of things going on in those two questions. Um, one, The formulation is the media giving him a choice. He has a choice. He's the president of the United States. He chooses the words that come out of his mouth and the words that don't come out of his mouth. He'll often say in his rallies, I could be presidential, but that would be boring. <laughs> and uh, the truth is, I don't think he can, because again, I think his, his uh, orientation is psycholo it's a psychological, best understood as a psychological thing. And he has these tells where, Whenever he says, um, he, he says things like, I have the best brain, 
or I have the best words, right? Or um, I could be presidential if I wanted to. He's basically telegraphing that he can't, that he can't help himself. He has, if there's ever been a president with impulse control, it's this one. And, uh, and so, but he's responsible for the things that come out of his mouth. I am utterly convinced, and I, I can tell you there are a lot of political consultants who agree with me on this, that if he simply stopped with the crazy tweets, it'd be worth five to eight points in approval rating. But he's in everybody's headspace. And when you talk to conservatives who love his tweets, they say, well, it's working for him. And I was like, how is it working for him? He can't break 40% approval. Um, the press, by all means, has gone nuts with Donald Trump. I agree with that. But one of the reasons why they go nuts with Donald Trump is because he loves it when they go nuts on him and he gives them reasons to do it. And it is a really dysfunctional symbiotic relationship between the two. Um, and so the raw question about the media in general, part of the problem that we have today, and I've been a media critic for decades, right, um, is that because of changes in the economy and the global and the media landscape, everything is balkanized. And media outlets no longer speak to the entire country, whether it's sitcoms or movies, um, because of things like Netflix, everyone is in a silo and you're speaking to a market niche rather than the whole country. 50 years ago, the New York Times could afford to make the American people eat their spinach. Same thing with CBS, which had like 70% market share for the CBS Evening News. The, C the, the major news networks, those news shows are watched by a tiny fraction of people. Sean Hannity is the highest rated guy on Fox on a normal, on a good night, he gets three and a half million people, meaning that 326 million people aren't watching him. And so what happens when you get siloed like this is that you ended up getting captured by your market and you end up giving your market what it wants to hear rather than what it needs to hear. And this is a problem for all the cable news networks. It's a problem across the media landscape. Um, there are very few voices that speak as objective arbiters of truth. And some of the ones who claim to be the objective arbiters of truth have gone so off the rails that it fuels this sense, this populist outrage that we're being lied to from people who are really haughty. And the Kavanaugh debacle demonstrated that better than anything else. The way there was this witch hunt atmosphere where rumors were seen as proof of other rumors, that uncorroborated allegations were enough to condemn a man, and the mainstream media from the New York Times and the broadcast networks on down played a huge role in that, and it was an unbelievable gift to the Republican Party, which is why three weeks, a month ago, I thought the Republicans might lose the Senate. Now they're gonna gain seats if these trends continue. The, the mainstream media does not understand how much they are their own worst enemy and how they behave. Uh, three questions to, to finish up. Uh, first question, uh, is there any uh, non-health related reason why Trump doesn't run in 2020. Uh, assuming he does run, who does he run against? Uh, and does he win? Well, uh, <laughs> is there any non-health related is there reason? Any reason why Trump wouldn't run again? Uh, assuming he doesn't have a heart attack or something? Uh, yes, it's imaginable. Uh, I mean, he is a billionaire. That's a reason. Um, he might want to, you know, he might want to live in more opulent surroundings than the White House uh, affords him. Um, people wondered why was he running for president after all. He had a great life in New York, why would he want to be president? Uh, and he might say after a very successful, an unprecedentedly successful first term, never in American history has anyone had such a first term. He might say, well, I've done everything I was elected to do, and I, I'm stepping down. Nonetheless, I think he will run. I think he will win. I think the, the uh, it, right now, I would say uh, Kamala Harris is probably at the top of my, my list of who the Democrat will be. Um, I, I largely agree with that. I mean, there are other reasons I can imagine why he wouldn't run. If the economy really went in the gutter, and his response to it was such that people lost faith in him. Uh, you could see him saying, sort of for the reasons that Charles alluded to, you know, I better just, you know, chalk up my victories and get the hell out of Dodge rather than lose. If he, I think one of the main reasons why he might not run is if it really looks like he just might lose. And he doesn't want to be a loser. 
he, was, he said, word, I think he said those exact words many, many times. <laughs> and if he leaves after one term, you can say, of course, I could have won. But, you know, I just, it's not worth it to me. And I could see him <laughs> like that. Um, there's also, look, there's a non-trivial chance. I think it's un very unlikely that Mueller finds something that is just earth shattering. Um, uh, I don't think there's any prospect of a, of a good, by which I mean successful, primary challenge to Donald Trump. And let me say right now, if I thought it was possible to primary challenge Donald Trump and defeat him and then go on to win the presidency for the Republicans, I would be entirely in favor of it um, without any trepidation whatsoever. Um, but because Donald Trump has done something that no other president has done, which is in totally stay uh, committed to his most populist base, those are the people who you rely on for insurgent primary challenges on incumbent presidents. And the idea that John Kasich, who's basically a human toothache, um, is going to rally raging moderates to his cause, I find very unlikely. Um, uh, um, and I think the only way a primary challenge works is if somebody, full disclosure, my wife works for Nikki Haley. I'm a big fan of Nikki Haley's. Um, I'm a, friends with Ben Sass. I'm a huge fan of Ben Sass's. The only way those things work is if they could persuade Republican voters that Trump is going to lose. We got to get someone who has a chance of winning. That's a hard sell to Trump's most passionate followers who believe any inconvenient news, poll, fact is fake news. Um, and whether he would win or not, I don't know. Again, I think the Democrats are setting themselves up for that 16-man collective action problem that the Republicans had. So you could see Michael Avenatti get the nomination. You could see, um, you know, uh, if the Constitution would allow it, you could see some sort of weird bioengineered chimera with three heads get the nomination. Um, the, uh, uh, but I think if the Democrats don't go that way, I, I think it is likely that Do Donald Trump will lose in 2020. Uh, not extremely likely, I could be wrong. But if you just look at where the intensity is in a national presidential election, which is very different electorate than a midterm election, um, and you look at the precedent that Barack Obama made of goosing up the base of the Democratic Party in a way that changed the electorate, uh, that strategy, I think, could very well work for Democrats, including Kamala Harris. And, uh, um, and then we'll see whether they choose a return to normalcy or they choose to do their sort of, we're going to do a left-wing Trumpism thing. And then we'll have another debate about all of these issues. Uh, something tells me we'll see these two gentlemen back here at Notre Dame in a, uh, <laughs> two years, perhaps, to talk about some of the same <laughs> themes. In uh, two weeks or so, we have uh, an event on the midterm elections. Uh, Ramesh Panuru from National Review and uh, Damon Linker from The Week will be here to debate and talk about the midterm elections. It's going to be on Tuesday, October uh, 30th at 1230 uh, here in, in Nanavik Hall. Uh, it should be a very interesting and good conversation about the uh, upcoming midterm elections. Um, please join me in thanking uh, Dr. Kessler and Mr. Gardner. <laughs>